Ready? Good morning, saints. Let's stand together. Let's make this our prayer this morning. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Again, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. With thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, we are amazed that you would want to dwell in us, that you would want to abide with us, that you would want to make residence in our heart. But that's what you said. If we would just place our faith in you and trust in you, you would make our bodies temples of the living God. That you would make our bodies a sanctuary where you are worshipped and loved on. And so, Lord, we thank you for making that possible through the death of your son and the resurrection of your son. Lord, we now get to enjoy that life. And Lord, I pray for people here right now who are dealing with sicknesses and, and, and deaths right now and uh, different things that are going on in people's lives. It's, it's hard to get here sometimes when we're dealing with the allergies and the, uh, and, and the struggles of life and uh, health issues. And God, I just pray that you, the healing balm of Gilead would fill this place and just touch people's bodies touch people's hearts and minds, broken hearts especially. Just bless them, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 You can have a seat. We have a few announcements for you. sister, you need to be at this retreat. God is going ahead of you, preparing a powerful, heart-transforming experience that you won't want to miss. May 7th is the deadline to fill out your registration form available in the lobby. You can leave your form with your deposit payment in one of the offering boxes on the wall at the back of the sanctuary. Now let me answer a few questions that some of you have asked. First, are scholarships available? Yes. We want every woman to be able to go who wants to. So there's a place to indicate that on the form. Second question, is there another way to save money? Yes, you and your friends can bring an RV. It's cheaper. See the registration form for details. Third question, what's the retreat schedule? Well, we now have schedules available for you in the lobby. Check it out. Finally, what about room assignments? We know that some of you are particular about who you room with. It's okay, we get it. On the sign-up form, there's a place for you to request the name of two of your friends that you want to be with. Later in May, we'll put up a room assignment chart in the lobby. Ladies, this retreat is going to be amazing. I want to see you there. Love ya.
Don't let your team down. Be there when they need you the most. Hello? Hello? Okay. Um, we're only going to be doing two songs today because we have a special treat for all of you guys after this. So here we go.
awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater and our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. Comes in the morning, and when 
work together for my good. Oh, you make all things work together for my good. Yes, you make all things work together for my good. Thanks, guys. Um, can I uh, have y'all greet each other? Give some holy hugs, handshakes. I don't know. I kind of think. <laughs> All right, I'm back, guys. Um, I am very pleased to announce this is my mom, Jerry James, and she's going to be uh, sharing a testimony and doing some special music for you guys. So. Okay, so I can't feel my hands or my feet, and this is what happens every time I get up in front of a church, and that's part of the reason why I don't do this often. So, uh, so I apologize ahead of the time. Thank you, Sophia. And this is actually for Sophia and all of my kids and my family, my husband, this morning that I'm up here. They actually didn't know I was going to be here because I left on Friday. Uh, James' family came under some hard times, and uh, as a mom and a wife, I'm there all the time, 24-7, and it gets to be a bit overwhelming. And I, just, I think that we need to be real if we're going to have church because – then we can allow God to really move. And so um, so I went and I stayed with a couple this weekend. I had no intention of severing anything or, or, or hurting my family in any way. I just needed a break. And, um, and this couple is awesome. Uh, their names are Bruce and Roma Green. And I went to their ranch, and, uh, and all their children are grown. Um, and both my parents uh, passed away within five years of each other, so I can't turn to my own folks, you know, when, when I need to talk to someone. So I went to Bruce and Roma, and... They spoiled the heck out of me and kind of turned me into a kid again, which is awesome because it helped me to step back and kind of see what I had. And uh, when I was heading into Marcola, there was this huge, awesome rainbow, like um, one that I haven't seen since my dad was in the hospital. Um, when my husband drove me to uh, Washington to say goodbye to my dad because he was really sick, and we didn't have the money at all. We were really broke, new family. And, um so we didn't really know what we were doing. Why are we driving all these miles? But anyway, we get there um, to Washington, and my husband looked at me and said, I really think we're supposed to be here. And it wasn't long after the, the rainbow had stretched from one side of the road to the other. It was beautiful. And uh, it was really cool. I was heading into Marcola yesterday, and I seen a rainbow just like that. Um, and so I jumped out of my little MPV minivan like a freak. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> because I was trying to go back into the childlike spirit in order that God might be God, you know. Um, and I was really excited about this rainbow because, you know, it was kind of just a, an encouragement to my faith, a little nugget, if you will, and I took a picture of it, and I was just in awe. Uh, so anyway, had a really great weekend. But again, I do apologize for my awkwardness. I, um, I'm a country western singer, you know, and I can sing in bars, and I can sing on any stage country western music, but... <clears throat> When it comes to uh, the great responsibility and the reverence, I'm going to use my notes right now. 
I also speak in radio, and I'm not a chicken or a coward like this, so what is this about? But um, I take uh, the stage of God with great reverence and responsibility that I would never want to take away from his glory in any way. And I'm a bit of a coward <laughs> when it comes to performing worship. So, you know, but I want to talk about Sophia real quick and just ask you guys to please um, recognize uh, the once a month that the girls come in and they perform on the stage uh, has been a huge return blessing to me um, because I haven't been involved in ministries for years, but my kids have been a testament. They were all dedicated as babies and they've been raised up the best that we could do um, with our beliefs in the, in the Lord. But Sophia um, has been a solid rock and uh, Whenever Brian and I go through things, I always tell the kids, don't worry about us, but please just take a knee and pray. And God is really awesome, and he will hear our prayers, and he will help this family. Because I don't believe that darkness wants families to make it in this day and age. And I believe that ministry is not always what it seems, that sometimes holding your family together is the biggest ministry that you could do for this generation of people. So uh, my husband, thank you. So, uh, so my husband and I both come from a really uh, dark past, and I'm not going to go into that, but our, I mean, our families and things that we witnessed as kids, and, and the odds were stacked up against us completely since the day we took each other's hands in marriage. But uh, when I married him, I married him with, with God in the center as a threefold cord, and I took vows to him for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, and, uh, and I didn't care what came against us, whether it was fires or floods or whatever the trials were going to be that through God we can do all things and we can make it through our trials if we hang on to him. And we've been married for almost 18 years and it's been a fight. And I, I'm not going to say it's you know, been, it, that it's been any kind of walk in the tulips. We've been waiting for it to get easier. Um, but with four kids and with the increasing struggles of the economy and finances, whatever you want to say, holding it together has been all I can do. And being real with you this morning and confessing my weakness, I do that so that you will pray for our strength and so that we can pray for your strength in return. But please appreciate my daughter, Sophia, and uh, my other girls when they get up here, the sacrifice. Sophia was going to drop out of ministry last week. Because uh, as I said, the James family has come under some really tough times. And I looked at her, and I know I'm a hypocrite. I know I can be the biggest of them all. But I said, Sophia, please don't drop out of ministry. And if she still decides to, I know, you know, this is no judgment. That is her decision completely. And it was nothing against the church. It was that she had too much on her plate. And that's always me, too much on my plate. So I'm very unbalanced. But I said, if you will hold back this one portion for God, I believe with all my heart that he will fill in all the details and bless you. And I do believe that. And I believe that since I became a Christian when I was a 15-year-old girl. I'm 35 now. And God always brings me back to that reminder and that strength that if we will put him first and drop to our knees during hard times, that he will fill in all the blanks and he will help us. And he has never, ever failed me. And he's no respecter of persons. So if he can help me, then he can help any one person in here. I know for sure that if you knock, he'll open it. I'm going to wrap this up, and I apologize that I drug it out. Um, but I just want to say Sophie is a picture of a warrior, and when she was a baby girl, I was uh, in a Pentecostal church, and so I was a little on fire, an overzealous mom, praying over my, my tummy, you know, and, and praying over my kids constantly. In fact, she was bald until she was like two, and I prayed that God would give her a mane, and she's got quite the mane. <laughs> it's just funny, but anyway, Brian and I, we went into, a, um, into her bedroom when she was little. She was only probably two and a half. And we heard this, this, the sweetest sound, and it was a little Sophia with her Snoopy chair turned towards the wall, laying hold of heaven. And uh, my husband was low crawling on his belly because he wanted to hear every word that she was saying, and he didn't want to distract her, the real life capture of that. But we'll never forget it. And I will say that um, because of my daughter's courage and what she has demonstrated to me is the reason that I'm up here, and I'm here to give back. Uh, and demonstrate strength to my kids and to my husband and my weakness right now and to all of you. And with that, we're just going to go ahead and take an offering, and I'm going to struggle through a song and let God be God.
Can I get somebody to pray for me, please? Just for strength right now. Kyle. Now, if I can sing for my dad, who sang as beautiful as Elvis Presley, and I kid you not, he was a legend. To stand in front of him and his eye of scrutiny, and his ear, he could hear every key that was off. Uh, but when he was in the hospital, that nothing else mattered, but that Christ was his savior, and his life uh, was turned over to him, and he became a Christian. And uh, I turned my angry words towards my dad I told him I was sorry for charging him with everything he did wrong and I forgave him and I said dad can I sing to you and I wasn't a very strong singer at the time I'm still very much developing and he said I would like that and he had a really deep baritone he said I would like that honey and I sang to him two hymns that mean so much to me share those with you this morning because I believe that my dad and my mom having accepted Christ all their sins have been forgiven and washed and we hold up a firewall for the next generation of kids that we not carry on the circle of chains to them but I believe they're in the grandstand this morning and with us in fellowship he brought me
was broken nets and strife, but he made something beautiful out of my life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. All right, don't you love the James family? They're the best. <clears throat> Richard, did you want to take the youngins? Something beautiful, something good. That's the Lord. Isn't it? I love... that spirit of humility and sharing and being vulnerable like that. And I really appreciate Jerry. She just came up to me and she said, can I do it? I've been trying to get her uh, up here for a long time. She kind of explained why you don't see her, but uh, uh, what a blessing her kids have been to us and, uh, and uh, just the James family. They're unique and they've been through a lot. But it's so healthy, I think, for us to, to show vulnerability. A lot of times we can get, come into a church and everything's hunky-dory and smiley and great. And, and sometimes it's just not. And, uh, and I appreciate your prayer, Kyle, and, and just your, your brokenness in that prayer was great. And so that's what the church needs to be about and to be transparent like that. It's really important. Amen? Well, speaking about transparency, we're in the book of Romans. Let's go ahead and turn there. Romans, if you don't have a Bible, lift your hand, we'll get one to you. One Bible over here. Thank you. And then I want you to stick your thumb into two passages, Matthew 7 and 1 Corinthians 5. Matthew 7, 1 Corinthians 5. Now I'm going to say this for the Kintais. The Kintais have been having a connect group and uh, sniff, sniff. No one's been coming. And so if you would like to go visit the Kintais over on uh, Sears Road, they would sure love your company. They have a beautiful home and a beautiful place for a connect group. So... This is where you can come and talk about some of the things we talked about today. So just to let you know, they'll be meeting there at 5 o'clock. So, Kintai's at 5. Almost sounds like a news program, huh? Kintai's at 5. No. <laughs> Romans 1. Uh, in 2012, Billy Graham, now 96, wrote, Some years ago, my wife Ruth was reading the draft of a book I was writing, when she finished a section describing the terrible downward spiral of our nation's moral standards and the idolatry of worshiping false gods such as technology and sex. She startled me by exclaiming, if God doesn't punish America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, of course, we've heard that quoted before that Billy Graham said it, but in reality, it was Ruth who said it. And Billy went on to comment that she was probably thinking of Ezekiel 16, 49 to 50, where God is explaining why he was bringing down the pagan cities in Israel. And it says this, look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness. Neither, she, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them as I saw fit. I took them as I saw fit. Now, I realize we're still on a subject that is sort of unpopular in church these days uh, because God's wrath is as real as God's grace. Did you know that? God's wrath is as real as God's grace. In other words, God loves the sinner. 
but God really hates the sin. So God is a lover, but God also hates as well. He hates sin. So before Paul can speak on God's grace, we must see the need for it. You know, I was wondering, when you're reading in the beginning of the book of Romans, you're going, man, what's the deal with all the sin and iniquity and corruption and wrath? And Well, in order for us to really appreciate grace, we have to know what state we were in before we received it. Otherwise, we're not going to appreciate it. You understand that? It's kind of like this. Our kids, they grow up, and they have no idea how hard mom and dad are working to take care of them, to bathe them, to clean them, to change their diapers, to get them to school, to go to their sport games, to purchase sneakers every year as they're growing, uh, every six months once they hit about 12 and they don't see any of that. They just, it's all provided. It's all given to them by grace. They're all receiving it. And so they, they have this idea as they're living in this world of bills are paid. There's no worry. Uh, they have a room that, you know, everything is paid for. They're oblivious to what's been provided. And it's only until they move out on their own, they discover, oh, I have to pay my own gas. Oh, I have to pay bills now. I have to pay the rent. Or, you know, I have to pay for insurance now. Oh, I didn't know because they were sort of oblivious to it. And it's the same with God's grace. If we are unaware of the ugliness of sin and its consequences, let alone the pain and suffering Jesus went through to pay the price for that sin, we're not going to appreciate God's grace one iota. You're going to take it for granted because you don't understand it. We're not going to appreciate grace until we see how badly we need it. Until you see how badly you need it, you're not going to appreciate it. So in your notes there, you'll notice Paul needs to address sin and the remedy through chapters 1 to 320. And you'll see there in the outline, one is sin, righteousness is needed okay that's the bottom line when we talk about what paul is getting ready to do he's, he says there's a problem here we're all sinners righteousness is needed before a righteous god righteousness is needed and you have a the gentiles are under sin we have been studying that verses 18 through 32 the gentiles are under sin b the jews are under sin we'll be looking at that today in the next section and that will reach right on through chapter 3, verse 8. And then from the rest of that, 3, 9 to 20, you see the whole world is under sin. So the Gentiles, the Jews, the whole world. Paul has to establish that and make that so clear to us so that when we hear about the message of God's grace, we'll really appreciate it. We'll really be like, wow, look what the Lord did. And it's so funny, it happens with our kids. You know, they go, Mom, Dad, I didn't realize what you were trying to tell me, but once I moved out on my own, now I really appreciate what you had to say. Now I really appreciate what you were trying to do. And it's the same with us as we grow in the Lord. We begin to understand that it is the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes. And the bad spell of man is the power of damnation to everyone that doesn't believe. Because this is the state we were in and why Jesus came to die for us. Because he loves us. So in review, we've been looking in chapter 1 after Paul clarifies sinful humanity. Sinful humanity, they suppress the truth. They exchange the truth for a lie. They refuse to retain God in their knowledge. And so finally, God gives them up. He starts giving them up to uncleanness and lust of their hearts. Then he gives them up to vile passions. And the Lord is saying, if you want to degrade yourself, if you want to devalue your life, okay, have at it. It's all yours. If you want it. And uh, so that takes place. And then if they continue to do that, which is shameful, the Lord says, okay, I'm going to give you over to deb debased mind. Now you're going to not only uh, uh, be involved in it and continue to uh, practice and being a part of it,
but you're going to celebrate it. You're going to flaunt it. You're going to parade and demand rights to do it. And, and the Bible says that's being given over to a debased mind. So in Romans 1, 28 to 32, Paul, uh, Paul lists for us 23 unfitting attributes of a debased mind. And you can look in there, and it's really interesting if you look at a uh, mind that's been transformed and you look at all those particular attributes and flip them to the opposite, that's what being a Christian is. And so, but these 23 unfitting attributes that lead to the death of the soul, referring to the Gentiles. And so today I entitled this message, Judging Righteously or Judging Sinfully. And so we're, we're going to be looking at the first half of Romans 2. The outline there is, you'll see in your notes, judgment is according to God's truth. So that's the first portion of chapter 2. Judgment according to God's truth. And then next week we'll look at judgment is according to uh, a person's deeds. And then judgment is according to the gospel of Christ. So that's uh, Romans 2. Am I going too fast? Okay. All right. Just if you're taking notes on the outlines there. So let's begin in Romans chapter 1 verse 32. After Paul lists these 23 unfitting attributes, this is what he says who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who what? Practice. Not goof, not make a mistake, not give in to, this, uh, to the, the uh, temptation of it, but those who practice such things, speaking of the Gentiles, are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Now I'm going to be giving some Greek definitions, not to try to impress you because I don't know Greek, but I think it's important that when we look at the Greek definitions, they make a little bit more sense. Sometimes our English, I like to call it a mutt language. It's got a little Latin in it, it's got a little Greek in it, you know, it's just, it's a mixture of languages all kind of brought together. And so a lot of times it loses its clarity and meaning. But that Greek word practice is proso, P-R-O-S-S-O, -S -S -O, and it means to do or accomplish, to do or accomplish. Now, my soul, uh, my soul, he is my soul, my son, Coleman, he's uh, playing baseball right now, and uh, they practice a lot. But he doesn't go out there to practice striking out. He doesn't go out there to practice hitting foul balls. He doesn't go out there to practice errors on the field. The purpose of his practice is to become a better player, a better hitter, a better fielder. That is, he practices proso. He does to accomplish being better at it, not becoming worse or practicing the opposite of what the game is meant to play. You don't want to foul out and strike out and, and make errors. And so Paul's point here is that the pagans, that is, they proso, they do they, what they do to accomplish these sinful lifestyles. They do that which is unfitting. They flaunt it. They march for it. They celebrate it. They demand rights for it. Even approve of others who do the same. OK, so that's the idea of practicing. It's really important that you understand that because a lot of people blow it and make mistakes. I understand that. But these are those who literally go out on the field and say, how can I practice foul balls? How can I practice striking out? How can I practice making errors on the field? OK, so that's what Paul's talking about. Now, let's look together as we, we consider this now that now, now you're reading this as a Jew. Let's, let's go back to when Paul originally wrote this. And you're reading this as a Jew. You're living there in Rome and you're going to one of these churches and you're reading this at the time and uh, you'd be nodding your head with disgust at these simple Gentiles. How could they? Unbelievable. What sinners and what not, right? But Paul's going to assert it takes one to know one. Okay? 
Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. Therefore, okay, every time you see the word therefore, what do you got to do, Kyle? That's right. You ask what it's there for. Based on what was just said. Therefore, you, who's the you? The Jew, are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. Remember, they're looking at these terrible sins, this terrible, sinful lifestyle, these Gentiles shaking their heads in disgust. He goes, now wait a minute. Takes one to know one. You guys are excusable who judge, which means to decide mutually or judicially to take the place of God. For in whatever you judge, another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same thing. You might have the ability to know right and wrong, but you are practicing the same thing. Proso, same word. But watch this, he says, you are inexcusable. So why is Paul saying that? Well, it's where we get the word apologetics, okay? Uh, it's actually anapologitos, and it's where we get it's apology, but it's not the apology in the sense of begging one's pardon, but in the sense of talking oneself off of a charge. Like, I'm not guilty. I'm excused because I'm Jewish and we have the law. And so Paul is saying, hey, brothers, you can't take a stand outside of humanity just because you're Jewish and you know the law. And though it's true that you're God's own special people, you as well must turn away from your sins. It goes both ways. As a matter of fact, Paul's going to say, you guys are even more responsible because you know better. Okay? Now this is going to be flipped upon the Christian because a lot of times we as Christians can be very judgmental toward the sinner as if we've risen to some new height of righteousness of our own. And so that's why it's so applicable to us today. We are responsible because we know better. So Jews were responsible to live up to the light. And what was the light for them and their thinking? Why, it was the Torah. It was the law of God. And what did the Lord promise the Jews? Isaiah 42, verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. You see, their responsibility was not to avoid the Gentiles. Their responsibility was to be a light and an example to the Gentiles on how to live life. And they refused to do that. And Paul reminds them, therefore, you are excusable, old man. You're talking yourself off from the charge. Whoever you are, who you who judge, take the place of God for him. Whatever you judge, another you condemn yourself for you who judge, practice or accomplish the same things. Now, have you ever noticed this? I don't know if you've noticed this before, but have you ever noticed how horrible your sins look on somebody else? Have you ever noticed that? Oh, how could they? How, sh I mean, why did she? How could he? As if we have never done it ourselves. And they always look worse on somebody else. And, uh, you know, I can be filled with all kinds of, you see, now that I'm a Christian, I can be filled with all kinds of righteous outrage. Well, the Bible says, and the Bible says, you know, and I can go off on my, my rage, you know, but, but if I'm blowing it, well, I have excuses. I have a reason. Well, it's not like that, and I can justify it because, you know, after all, I believe in God's grace and everything, and so, so it's, it's different for me. No, it's not. It's the same for everybody. And so that's why he's challenging them. If I'm doing it, and I can explain it away and justify my intentions, but Jesus said this in John 7, 24, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. And why did he say that? 
because the Pharisees were saying that Jesus was a demoniac. He has a demon. God in human flesh, they were saying that Jesus was a demoniac and that he was healing on the Sabbath day. So therefore, he must be demon possessed. And so Jesus says, don't judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment in God's truth. That's righteous judgment. So how do you and I judge with righteous judgment? Because we are to judge. It doesn't mean we can't judge, but we need to do it righteously. How? That's why I want you to hold your place here and turn to Mar uh, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. I'm sure you've heard this a few million times. Judge not, lest you be judged, right? Or condemn not, lest you be condemned. Verse 2. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Okay, now, does that say you can't judge? No, it says, if you're going to judge, make sure that the judgment is upon you as well, and that as you are judging someone, that you are not doing the same thing, that you are not practicing the same thing, just because you might know the answer to the question or whatnot. Make sure you're able to withstand the same judgment without people ducking the plank that's in your eye, right? Because Jesus said that's hypocritical. If someone's telling you, hey, you shouldn't be doing that, like, you know, I, I, I feel bad for my dad at the time because, you know, he, he didn't know the Lord and stuff, but he's sitting there punishing my brother Scott for smoking cigarettes while he's smoking a cigarette. It just doesn't work. He would make my brother eat a pack of cigarettes. He'd literally make him go eat a cigarette, uh, a pack of cigarettes when he caught him smoking while he's sitting there smoking a cigarette. That's hypocritical. You can't do that. That doesn't work. And so, you know, my dad's waving around this big plank in his eye while he's trying to look at the speck in his son's eye. So Paul takes this, uh, Paul even takes this a step further when we talk about taking God's truth, when we make a judgment, when we're making righteous judgment. He takes it a step further in 1 Corinthians 5. So turn there, 1 Corinthians 5. This is a little bit more shocking, and yes, it's New Testament. Thank you very much. You could tell, couldn't you? Okay. Allergies. Blah, right? I didn't used to get them, but this year with all the rain, it's bad. Okay, 1 Corinthians 5, 11 through 13. Now, this is tender. This is like, ooh, this is uncomfortable for us, perhaps. But I'm going to show you just how much the Christian community has changed over the years, how the world has impressed into the into uh, the church. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, that is sex outside of marriage, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Now, today, with all kind of the message that goes out today, that would be so unloving. That would be so ungracious to be that way towards somebody. But Paul says this is Bible. This is new covenant thinking. Uh, it's quite the opposite because if a brother or sister in the Lord is living openly like that 
and people know it, that you are a brother and you're hanging out with them, guess what? You could be tagged with the same thing. And the thing is, is that we are responsible to call them out as long as long we're not doing it. See what I mean? So this is like a, a, a like a built in purification system. That if you're going to judge, make sure that that judgment can be measured to you as well. And this is a great parenting tool as well. Because I know as parents, we can get pretty tough on our kids, but we can do the same things just because we're adults now, as if it doesn't apply to us. But as we continue on, Paul continues and he says, for what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are on the inside? Paul is talking about this step, this guy was, who was sleeping with a stepmom in the church. They were flaunting it. They were doing it in the open. Everybody knew about it. No one was dealing with it. And he goes, you need to get that out. And he goes, it's not all right to judge on the outside. You need to judge those who are on the inside, verse 13. Those who are on the outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. The evil person being the rebellious believer in the church. Cast him out. Now, hang with me because we're not talking about being mean-spirited and unforgiving and nasty and harsh. But Paul is telling us something that's very important here. I love what my pastor once said about this verse. He said, there is a tendency on the part of the Christians today to want to judge the world and to change the culture. All too often, we're activists against the world's wickedness, but we fail to judge our own congregation. We march, petition, crusade, we vote, and we talk about the world's sin as we turn a blind eye to our own. We've got it exactly backward. We're to deal with the Christian community and let God take care of the world's iniquity. So Paul writes this because a guy was sleeping with a stepmother and, and everybody in the church was ignoring it and not dealing with it. So what does Paul tell us that we're to do in the church today? Look in verse 7 and tell me what that first word is in chapter 5, verse 7 of 1 Corinthians. Therefore, what? Purge. Purge out the old leaven. Leaven is a type of what in the Bible? Sin. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, that everyone can call you lumpy, okay? Since you are truly leavened, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Now, I'm going to say this again, and I'm, I want to say this gently, but I think the church at large has become way too soft on sexual immorality in the church, so much so that there are Christians who live together and have sex before marriage, and it's not a big deal. And you guys probably know a lot of them. It's not a big deal, but it was, and it is to the Lord, and it is to the Apostle Paul. And so I think this is important. So why do they do it? Why do, because I don't really want to blame the people. I blame the church. I don't think we have called it out enough. And, and if we have called it out, we've done it in a harsh way, chasing people away rather than loving them into the kingdom. We've chased them away by judging them coming down on them rather than doing it out of love to restore. So how do we pull the plank out of our own eye? How do we get away from this concept? Well, everybody's doing it. How do we pull the plank out of our own eye? Well, Paul suggested in Ephesians 5, 8 through 11. I'll just read this to you. For you, can you show that? There it is. Now what's that? For you what? were 
Is that past tense? Okay. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light for the fruit of the Spirit in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out, which means you have to seek the Lord, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And the only way you can do that is to remember from whence you came. And I think Celebrate Recovery does such a great job in that because these guys constantly remember, you know, we know who we are and where we came from and we're here to restore. We're, we're here to help people recover. Right, Harv? Isn't that what you're supposed to do? To help recover. And so that's what I love about that ministry. But... Here we're called to walk as children in the light. And yet we're called to judge as well, to judge those who are on the inside. So how do we do it without becoming these timid, well, I'm not going to say anything, I'm just going to ignore the leaven that's in the church or leaven that's in a, a community, a, a church community or whatever. Um, and a lot of people, you know, I think we grade particular sins as, well, this is important to the Lord, or this matters to the Lord, but this doesn't. And so we'll look at, okay, being addicted to drugs, that's, that's bad. Being an alcoholic, that's bad. But what about internet gambling? What about being addicted to gaming when, when that becomes your only thrill in life, or YouTube, or whatnot? What about pornography? That's become... A very quiet subject. What about compulsive shopping? Uh, or can I say very lightly compulsive eating? Where you can't control your eating. I think it's great to pig out on Thanksgiving every year. But what if that's your problem every day? These are things that need to be addressed and go, you know, this is wrong. This is not this is, uh, this is a bad witness to our community. And uh, the Lord spoke to my pastor years ago when he was being wrongly misrepresented because, you know, there's that consternation. Should I judge? Should I confront? Man, I messed up myself. And, and we were always in that kind of place of, well, I'm not going to say nothing, but yet uh, I, I see this brother, he's going down the wrong path, or my sister, she's blown it or whatever. And I love what, my, uh, what the Lord told my pastor. He said, hey, John, you love him, I'll judge him. You love him, I'll judge him. In other words, sometimes we want to be the judge and we think this should happen and this should be dealt with and God will deal with it in his good timing. So our call is just to love them and let God do the judging. But if we're going to impact our society and point them to Jesus, then, then I think this is the thing. Because guys, whether we like it or not, we're all judging something all the time. Whether what's right, what's wrong. Even in our own lives, sometimes we can overjudge and overexamine ourselves so much so we're completely depressed and thinking we can never lift our head because we're such losers. Listen, that's where grace comes in. Okay, now stick with me because watch this as, as he says there in verse one. Now go back to Romans chapter two, verse two. And let's look at this. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who what? Practice, there's that word again, such things. Okay, you see, we all stumble, we all make mistakes, right? But this is people who practice these things. Verse 3, and do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? In other words, do you think just because you're a Jew or you're a Christian and you practice these things that you won't be judged, that you won't be dealt with? And how are you going to be judged? In your half sheet there on the opposite side, I think it, it just gives you some passages there of how does, 
how does the Lord judge or how, does, how do we face the judgment of the Lord? As believers now, as his kids, how do we get spanked? Okay, Hebrews 12, 6 says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. That is, when we get rebellious as believers, God can reel us in. And how does he reel us in? How does he chasten us? He uses the repercussions of our sin to catch up to us. This is why when people start going through the repercussions of sin, that it is very unjust for them to blame God for their woes and their worries because they brought it upon themselves. They're dealing with the repercussions themselves. That's how the Lord scourges and chastens them. Okay? He uses those repercussions. And then Galatians 6. Again, this is all New Testament, guys. Galatians 6, 7 through 8. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So grace or not, we can't fool ourselves into thinking that if we live in the flesh as Christians, we will escape the consequences of sin. Because the wages of sin is what? It's death. So that's why he tells us here in verse 4 of chapter 2, do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impet uh, in impenitent or unrepentant heart, it's a hard issue. You are treasuring or storing up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Here's what happens, guys, is that we mistake people and society is mistaking right now. Hey, we're doing all this sin and God's not, God doesn't seem to care. Like, we've been doing this, we've been doing that, or we've been acting this way, or we've been living that way, living this way, and God's not doing nothing. And so we think that we look at God's great patience and we go, why isn't God doing something about that? Well, just because we may see him being patient and forbearing doesn't mean he's approving of it. It means he's patient. And so when we see sin and nothing happening, it's, listen, this is huge. This is huge. And why Paul's bringing all this up and why it should hit us hard and heavy as to what this is talking about. When nothing is happening in our sin, we think like nothing's going, it doesn't seem like God really cares. Listen, that's not God's grace. That's God's patience. That's not God's grace. That's God's patience. He's waiting for you to repent, to stop lest the consequences of those sins destroy you. So he's patient with you. Now grace kicks in when the hardness of your heart softens and you repent. That's when grace comes in and helps you through. But grace isn't God ignoring your sinful activity. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? God is being patient. He's not being quiet. He's being patient and saying, Jeff, you know better. Jeff, come on. Jeff, don't. Oh, Jeff. Oh, you don't want to go there. Jeff, okay. And I can't tell you the countless pastors who have fallen after the consequences finally catch up to them or anybody else, because they will catch up to you. They always do. Sin will find you out. So what that does for me is helps me evaluate not how you're doing and what you should be doing, but how I'm doing and examining my own heart. 
And this is why Israel is such a great example for me. How God isn't approving of the rebellion, but he's very patient. Think of God's goodness with Israel. He gave them great possessions materially. He gave them spiritual riches. He promised them a land. He gave them this wonderful land. He gave them a righteous law, a temple to build, and a priesthood to where they could go and worship him freely without the the burden of sin on their lives. But in time, they began to defy God. And God waited, and he was patient, and he was patient. And that's the whole purpose, guys, of the prophets. Do you understand the prophets, their main message was repent to the nation of Israel? Because he was saying, guys, you don't want to go in this direction. And what ended up happening is finally they were brought into what? Slavery, captivity, because of their defiance toward God. God said, okay, if you want to be in slavery, if you want to give into other gods, you're going to go into captivity. And I'll give it to you for 70 years because you skipped those Sabbath years. 70 years you're in captivity. And they were swimming in idolatry by that time. And the Lord was so faithful. And so then the Lord gets them out of captivity. Okay, let's, let's try it again. Then Jesus, their Messiah, comes on the scene. And what do they do? They crucify him. We don't want this man to rule over us. We don't want your Messiah, God. Okay, and so basically the Lord says, okay, but it's not going to go well for you. And Jesus said, you guys should have known the day. You should have known. But now your house is left unto you desolate. And God in his grace and his patience waits 40 more years for them to repent. And they don't repent. And by 70 AD, the Roman general Titus comes in and wipes out the city. And they were leveled. Synagogues burned to the ground. Did God want that? No. But he let the sin play out. Okay? I've been patient. I've been waiting. I've been showing that I love you. But if you don't want it, then sin will consume you. And they were destroyed. Jesus foretold that. And we'll get to that because God, what's amazing is God is not through with the Jewish people. And we'll see that in Romans 9, 10, and 11. But at this particular juncture, right now to this present day, Israel is facing from her neighbors extinction. They're still then under that threat of judgment. But it was they themselves that brought it on themselves. Do you see how The Lord chastens those he loves. That's how he does it. He doesn't say, well, I'm going to go pick on somebody and go beat on them. He goes, I'm just going to let your sin catch up to you. And you'll have to pay the price. And your kids too. And your generations after you. But I'm trying to stop that with my son. And and if you live for my son and your generation after you, you will avoid so much problem, so many problems because now my grace is abounding in your life. And that's why we have to know this stuff before we appreciate grace that Paul talks about later on. John, my pastor, I I think of him often these days. I, uh, because I was thinking last week, you know, I gave my testimony and and just how I got saved and 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 I was I went to a church that was teaching through the Bible and I'll still never forget when he said, "Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. Sin is forbidden because it's bad." God isn't trying to keep you from a good time. He's trying to keep you from a bad one. And all the regrets and all the shame that goes with it, God is trying to keep us from it. But if you want to go there, okay, you'll you'll have to eat it and enjoy it. But at this particular juncture, I think right now it's kind of like we're storing up our nation Our world is kind of storing. It's like a dam. It's like there's a big pool and and all that judgment is there waiting. And that's why you read in the book of Revelation, man, it is one judgment after another, after another, after another, after another, because it's like a dam that is starting to leak and it will eventually just break and that judgment will finally come upon them. 
it's a it's it's going to be a sad thing and so this reminds me though to think before i judge uh for my own life specifically and really as a pastor because you know a pastor well we should do this and we should be that and it's like as i'm doing this i got three fingers pointing at me see and that's why I appreciate when Jerry came up and she he wanted to talk to me and it's like, go up there. It was perfect for what she was sharing, what she's going through and how vulnerable she is because we're all that way. We look at the, the girls and, and you realize, oh, no, Sophie, don't quit the ministry. You know, it's like because we don't realize, like if we were all to sit down and hear everybody, what everybody's going through, we'd be like, we'd be so much more compassionate toward each other or at least more aware of where people are at in their life. Everybody's going through something, struggling through something, and we would be more compassionate, and we would be less judgmental in the harsh way and more encouraging through God's grace and edifying one another. But I know so many of you are going through so many horrible things, and myself included, you know, with my wife and stuff, and and it's just so hard to to put all that heaviness on you, but... Then I, I'm able to hear your story and what you're going through. And I just go, oh, man, you know. And uh, that's why we need each other to hold each other up and to strengthen one another and pray for one another. So I just pray that even though we're going through that and that we are people who believe in God's grace and God's love, we have to remember that we are responsible and accountable if we claim the name of Christ. To be who he told us to be, to be those who are walking in the light. The Jews thought, hey, we're free. We're free. We're free of the judgment, man, because we're God's chosen and we're God's elect. But they were also as responsible, and that's why Paul's saying, hey, not so fast, you guys. You guys are even more responsible. But so too would you and me as Christians. We know better too as well. So we can't be pointing our finger at the world and saying, oh, how could they? How? But be aware or be educated as to what's going on in the world, but what's, what is it making you into? How is it affecting you? Before you point the finger, before you say, hey, brother, you need to do this, uh, look at the three fingers looking at you and examine yourself first so you don't whack them in the head with your plank. You know what I mean? But I think it's just very sober thinking because, I, listen, I love God's grace. And to me, that's what gets me through the reality of God's truth of who I am. What a lousy, rotten, stinking sinner I am. It's knowing what I deserve. And God says, I don't want you to have that. I want you to know my truth. I want you to know the absolute devastation of what sin will do to your life, whether you are a believer or whether you're not. It will destroy your life. At least as a believer, you can stop the bleeding through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he's the one that delivers you and gets you through because we're not immune to our own actions. Now, I believe that we are not appointed to that wrath to come because Paul makes that very clear throughout the scripture. But I think, I feel in a way that the church is way confused about these issues of judging. There is the importance of making judgment calls in the church. There is important things where people need to be purged from time to time if they're flaunting their sin and celebrating it in the midst of his people. Paul said so. That's not unloving. As a matter of fact, in the next cha in the next book, the Second Corinthians, he is saying, "Restore that brother; he has repented." And so that's what's so important. But with Romans two, Matthew seven, and let's just take First Corinthians four five to heart. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts then each one's praise will come from God. So, so guys, let's judge righteously. Let's judge in God's truth. Let God be the judge 
and in his truth, in love, judge ourselves first, but also not allow the leaven to grow in our midst. Let's be bold, let's be wise, but let's be gracious and let's be kind. Amen? Amen? George, can you come up and close us?